done is we've taken a wave packet, we've loaded it into the edge of the wave packet, and it's following it. It's moving around the <coughs> periphery of this island as the kicks proceed, and after about 10 kicks, it gets back where it started and starts moving around it all again. So you can circumnavigate this wave packet in the <coughs> space as you increase the number of kicks. And of course, as you do that, that leads to periodic changes in the energy of the state, because here the state is relatively close to the no nucleus when it's already localized. So this is a relatively low end state. Here it's further away, so it's a somewhat higher end state. And you can actually see this. You can actually monitor the motion around the wave packet using half cycle propulses. So we can then efficiently load a state into one of these islands, okay? And it stays trapped there. We can put 80, 90 percent of an initial atom population into that. Then you say, well, okay, now I've got this state in the island locked, synchronized to the drive frequency. What happens if I change the drive frequency? Well, if I change it slowly enough, it turns out that the wave packet will remain locked and synchronized to the drive field. So let's say now then that we load an island. So here's that big state <coughs> island, and we've loaded a wave packet into that, indicated by red. <coughs> Now we slowly down chirp the kick frequency, so the spacing between the kicks slowly increases. What happens? Well, simulations actually show that the wave packet remains locked to the drive field. Now, as I reduce the kick frequency, notice that the time period between pulses goes up, the atom has to move to higher and higher end states to stay synchronized with the drive kick. So then the stable island moves out to larger values of position because the, the bigger end, the bigger the state. Okay? But as it does that, you notice that you can actually maintain that state, that wave packet, locked to the island. So as we down chirp this, what happens is the wave packet will move out to higher and higher values of end. So now then, let's talk about then these quasi windy atoms that are, by, uh, that are being driven, okay? So we localize, we take a localized N equals 350 wave packet, we look, put it in one of these stable islands, and then we slowly down chirp the half cycle pulse frequency to drive to some final target in high end state. So every pulse, we increment the time by 600 picoseconds, 670 picoseconds, longer than the one that came before. So this will be 3 nanoseconds, <coughs> 3 nanoseconds plus 67, 670 picoseconds, and so it goes. We just keep lengthening the duration. And what is shown here is the calculated scaled energy of the reverse as a function of the number of kicks. We started out with a scaled energy of a half, minus a half, and then this shows the end distribution as a function of the number of kicks. And you see that it remains narrow. It's not broadening out. And you see that it's moving to progressively higher energies, which means <coughs> it's moving to progressively higher values of n. <coughs> and as shown by the simulations, the final state remains strongly quasi-one-dimensional, strongly polarized. Okay? So, this suggests then that we're going to be able to exert considerable control over the end distribution by simply chirping the frequency of the kicks. And this, in fact, is true. One way to demonstrate this particularly well is to say, OK, we'll do what the grand old Duke of York did. Take your army, march them to the upper hill, march them back down again. So we start out with atoms with n equals 350. We lock them into a drive train. We chirp the drive train and we lower its frequency for 25 gigs. We hold it constant for 10. And then we decrease it, we up chirp it for 25 for half cycle pulses, moving it back to 350. So if you've got really good control, you can take these quasi 1D atoms at 350, move them up to 520, bring them back down to 350. Okay? Does this work? Well, by George, it does. If you actually go and do the experiments, you can show that this really does work. So what is shown here are selected field ionization profiles as a function of arrival time, and as arrival time increases, 
read increased like you feel. So here's the parent state, n equals 350, and you see it ionizes at late times. So it's ionizing out here at 3.5 microseconds. Now here we tune the laser to excite states at selectively higher end. So 387, 442, 505, 600, 700s. You see what happens is the SFI profile moves to earlier times, lower fields. Now here are data recorded when we apply a chirped pulse. <coughs> so here we are, this is the initial state. Now we're applying a chirp train of pulses. <coughs> As we increase the number of pulses in this chirp train, you see it steadily moves. The SFI profile steadily moves to earlier times. And after 50 kicks, you see that we populated about a narrow distribution of states around about n equals 700. Very few states are left out here. Most of the Rydberg atoms are locked to the field and transported up to n equals 50. Now here are data where we stopped after 25 kicks, so this was after 25 kicks, and then we started increasing the frequency. And you see when you do that, so this is now increasing the number <coughs> of, chir of kicks as we chirp them up in frequency. And you see, by George, we're moving back towards n equals 350. So you can efficiently transfer between different N levels using a chirp train of half cycle pulses. And in principle, you can go up to any value of any one by just having enough time to do the down chirping and making sure that everything remains locked. Now, we're not the only people who use chirp frequencies to actually transport atoms between states of different N. Tom Gallagher has done this, and he can explain this better than I do. But he used, instead of train of pulse, chip of kicks, he used actually microwave pulses. So he created a non-dispersive wave packet in which the electron was moving synchronously then with a microwave field. He started out with atoms at n equals 70. And what he's shown here is an SFI profile for the states as a function of the drive field that he's using in his microwave. <coughs> so initially, with no microwave field, he's starting out with states that ionize around about 30 volts per centimeter. These are n equals 70. Then what he does is he applies this microwave, he, he chirps the microwave field, chirping it down from 19 to 13 gigahertz in about 500 nanoseconds, and looks to see what that chirping does to the final end state of the atoms. And as this shown here is the strength of the drive, microwave drive field that is chirping. And what he observed was, if you have a volt, microwave field of about a volt per centimeter, and you down chirp it, you notice now the SFI profile is peaked at n equals 79. So what he was able to do was to transport atoms from n equals 70 to n equals 9, 79, or 7, 70 to 79, by chirping then a microwave field. And again, he was able to analyze this using avoided crossings between three <coughs> states. Not everything that he saw was intuitive. There were counterintuitive cases where he could down chirp to move to higher frequencies and to lower frequencies. But if you need to learn more about that, ask Tom. <coughs> but it's kind of neat. So then the next question you have is, well, I was talking about chirping and driving states to higher end. And to do this, we're using kicks that were synchronized to basically the electron orbital period. So the kicks were of the order of the orbital period. What <coughs> happens if I go to high scale frequencies where now during a single orbit I apply a lot of kicks? So let's look at data for n equals 570 with 15 kicks per orbit. Okay? And here's data recorded with a kick strength in scale units of 0.12 or 0.24. And there's data where the kicks are towards the nucleus, data where the kicks are away from the nucleus. This is kicking away and towards the nucleus. So we start out, we make the n equals 570 state by a localization kick, kick it to a high end, and then now with the end distribution. Wait a little while for it to come to quasi equilibrium, and then apply these train of high frequency kicks. Now, if you kick away from the nucleus, as you increase the number of pulses, not much happens. You just get a monotonic decrease. If, however, you kick towards the nucleus, you see that you get a non-monotonic behavior. There are regions where if you give it a couple of extra kicks, the survival <coughs> probability actually increases. That's a bit counterintuitive. What's going on? More kicks? 
my gosh, it's more stable. What's happened? Okay? So the survival probability can actually increase as you give it more kicks. How does this work? Well, it's all tied up with scattering from the nucleus. So these are the results of calculations. So here is now the scale of energy. The continuum is the dashed line. So this is our initial state. Localized after the kick sequence, we've got the distribution of energies, but localized around about 520. And then this is how the distribution varies as we go up in end. So this is the number of kicks. If we're kicking away from the nucleus, you see this distribution just broadens out <coughs> and gradually moves into the continuum. If we kick towards the nucleus, this state initially, the energy distribution bifurcates. You can see it's now got two peaks. One of these peaks moves into the continuum. The one that's localized and still bound stays here. As we give even more kicks at some point, this bifurcates. You see it here now, bifurcating. And you get a second wave, if you like, that moves into the continuum. But again, there is still some bound. And then at later times, it bifurcates and another wave moves into the continuum. And so it happens. So what is happening? Well, this results because of multiple scattering from the core, from the core. Basically what happens is the following. Under certain conditions, you can imagine that the electron is going towards the nucleus. I give it a few kicks, so it gains energy. It turns the nucleus, and it's coming back the other way. Now when I give it kicks, it actually loses energy, because I'm kicking in the opposite direction to its motion. So it was about to escape, but now it's losing energy, so it becomes a little more bound. And these waves correspond to one scattering, two scattering, three scattering, etc., from the nucleus. Okay? Now, the nice thing about going to high scale frequencies is there's always the hope of observing what's called quantum localization. This is being observed with Rydberg atoms by driving them with microwaves at very high frequencies. It has not been observed by driving them with kicks. And if we can get to very high scale frequencies, in principle, you can actually do that. Because if you, classically, if, if you look at the survival probability versus the number of kicks, the more kicks you give it, the more likely it be, should be to be ionized, right? So as the number of kicks goes up, the survival probability goes down. Quantum mechanically, that follows for a while, but then actually the survival probability levels off. You get what's called quantum localization. It's the analog of Anderson localization in condensed matter. And if you can do about 100 kicks at high scale frequencies, you should be able to see that. We've not been able to do that yet, but it's kind of one of the holy grails down the road. Now, I've talked about ionization by fields that were always kind of in one direction, principally. Let's consider now what happens if we take alternating fields. So now we have a kick one way, a kick the other way, a kick one way, a kick the other way. Okay? And how does the system that is kicked in alternating directions respond? Okay? Well, it turns out if you have alternating kicks, you get chaotic motion. There are no ions of stability. And the ionization mechanism itself is explained in what theorists term a turnstile. This is a classical structure in phase space that promotes electrons from bound to unbound states. And that's the critical step in ionization, going from a bound state to an unbound state. Okay? Now, such turnstiles are important to chaotic transport in many physical systems, not just Rydberg atoms, but Rydberg atoms are a great way to see them. And in fact, they provided one of the first ways to see the effect of turnstiles. You can sort of understand them by Poincaré map. So here's the momentum. This would be z in my usual coordinates as a function of <coughs> coordinates. And you see this red line and this blue line? They delineate the region between bound states and unbound states. A phase point inside this region is bound. The phase point out here on the other side of these lines is unbound. Now, here you'll also see a series of wiggly things. Now, these are referred to as lobes by them in the node. And basically, the thing that's important is, if you have a system with an initial phase point in this region of phase space, and this is what's called the turnstile node, it will, after the next cycle of kicks, one kick cycle, it will move into the continuum. And this will be where it is. Okay. So an initial phase point in this region of phase space is ionized. And if I had another cycle of kicks, that point would move over to this gray region 
it would remain ionized, and then it would move over to this one. So successive kicks come, it would go from here to here to here, stay unbound. Whereas if this state was initially here, then the next kick cycle would move it to here, so it would be bound to bound to unbound to stay unbound. Okay? So this turnstile load is the critical thing for taking you from being bound to being unbound, to being ionized. Now you can also get capture loads. So if your initial phase point was in here, after the next kick, it goes into this region here. And after the next kick, it would go into this region. And it would remain bound. So this is a capture load. The electrons whose initial phase points are here are captured and stay captured. They were initially in the continuum, but they're ultimately captured and stay there. Okay? So read theory then defines these regions of phase space that are associated with electron capture and or escape. Okay? But the key thing is any electron with phase space a phase point in here is ionized after the next kick cycle and stays ionized for successive kick cycles. Or if it started here, the next kick cycle <coughs> would stay bound, but then be unbound. Okay? So what we did experimentally was we isolated a single kick cycle, which is just the region shown in red here. We isolated a single kick cycle, and then we would take and place our initial phase points in this region or outside this region and look and see what the survival probability did. And if you do that, you get something like this. So here we here are the sequence of kicks we use. Here's our localization kick. After allowing it to localize, we apply one cycle of the kick. And you say, well, why did we do this? It's a half cycle, a whole one and a half. That's because you get time reversal invariance. If you start in the middle of one of the kicks, you get time reversal invariance with the theorists going left and right. And you see that when we do this, the survival probability depends on the delay time, in other words, how well localized our state is, and differs for different time periods, t going from 5 nanoseconds to 11 nanoseconds for these period, period of this pulse. And here's data for 306, here's data for 350. And let's see if this does what we would expect. You see there's a fairly strong oscillation in survival probability. Well, if we go to t equals zero, what we have is a state in phase space that is distributed fairly well around the initial, the initial um, locus of points. And there's pretty, but this gray region is the escape lobe. You see there's not very good overlap with the escape lobe. Some phase points are in here, but many are out here and out here. Then, if we wait about four nanoseconds later, you see that what's happened is there is a dearth of phase points inside the escape mode. They're mostly localized here and here. And by George, the survival probability goes up. But if we wait to 8 nanoseconds, then you see again that many of the phase points are back inside the escape mode. <coughs> survival probability goes down, and so it goes. We get this time-dependent oscillation. So what we've done is demonstrated that indeed, if you put a phase point inside this escape mode, it really does escape. Okay. Now, you can do the same thing without having to use a station, when using stationary states. If what you do is you simply vary the time period of the pulses and the kick strength. And this is shown here. Here's the ionization probability as a function of kick strength when we have time periods of 5, 11, and 13 nanoseconds. If you look at 5 nanoseconds, you see it comes up, there's a bit of a shoulder, and then it goes off pretty flat. If you go to late times, okay, so this is now where we're going to um, go to time 11 or 13 nanosecond time periods, then you see that it's a more monotonic increase. That's what we observe experimentally. What is calculated does much the same. If you have a time period of 5 nanoseconds, you see there's a pronounced shoulder. This is just a 1D theorem, so this is actually an approximation. And this is what happens if you go to late times. Okay? So you see that indeed the predictions made by turnstile theory actually agree with what we see. So we can actually see this behavior. Okay, well it's coming to the end, so let's talk about conclusions of future directions. I hope I've convinced you that one can exercise remarkable control over quasi one dimensional states. We can manipulate them pretty much anywhere we want. We can march them up and down the head. We can transiently localize them. 
we can make them chaotic, we can make them stabilize in various things. I hope I've also convinced you that <coughs> high end atoms provide a valuable laboratory to examine not only the dynamics and chaos. Look at the difference between classical and quantum chaos. It's a paradigm system that kicked out of the study of nonlinear dynamics. <coughs> also, I should need a little bit of ex ex expl explanation here. There has recently been a lot of interest in whether or not you can use the richness of nonlinear dynamics to do information processing. Okay? Basically, to make not necessarily analog data gates or something like this, but to make inferences from data sets. Okay? Do the sort of thing neural networks would do. So it turns out that you can look at chaotic systems, you can calculate how they ionize, and you can in principle predict that you should be able to do information processing. So this is like chaotic computing, which is the exact antithesis of quantum computing. So here you'd be using a chaotic system, using the richness of nonlinear dynamics to actually make inferences from large data sets. Okay? Currently, people have actually made uh, what are called chaos gates, kale gates. These are little circuits which have a clock in them, and depending as to how many times you clock them, they behave um, non-linearly, they behave randomly. You can make them into any particular gate you want, to no or not, complement to no, you name it, you can make it work as one of those gates. So there's a little bit of progress in this direction. But basically, you'd have to ask, if I show Rydberg atom a range of different values for a number of parameters, it would have to make a binary decision. Of, yeah, that's probably this, or no, that's probably not this. So it's like a neural network in a way. OK, another thing that you might be able to do in the future is observe this quantum localization at high scale frequencies, where you can actually suppress the, the, the chaotic ionization through classical diffusion. <coughs> And the final thing we hope to do is we hope to be able to create strongly interactive and big big atom pairs under well-defined initial conditions. I could take, say, two blockaded initial big big atoms, two initial quasi one day big big atoms at n equals 300 that are blockaded. Then with a couple of swift kicks, I can transfer those to n equals 300. So now the atom is sitting here, and it is now suddenly become n equals 600. They both are now n equals 600. And their initial phases and initial conditions are well known because they both have the same sequence of kicks. Okay? How do they interact? You'll never be able to produce two n equals 600 atoms of that radius, of that separation, because they're inside the normal blockade radius. So we can look at really strongly coupled Rydberg atoms under very controlled conditions. You know, would they subsequently ionize? Would the electrons go off, one interact with the other, one ionize, one block to a low state? What might happen? Okay? So that's one potential thing you might look at. You might say, well, if I can arrange it somehow that the electron on one is moving in concert with the electron on the other, so you have two dipoles like this, and you have the electrons doing this, if I now drive this by an RF field, can I make a quasi-stable state? Can I lock it to an RF drive field and make two electron excited molecules of two Rydberg atoms. So these are the kinds of dumb questions you can ask. And I'll talk a little bit about, more about those in the next <coughs> one of my talks. But today I hope I've just convinced you that A, high, high in Rydberg atoms are fun, and B, you can really do some quite interesting and remarkable things with them in terms of control and manipulation. Thank you.